Hey everyone, I'm Sarah, and this is part two of a series where we are building a circuit for this sender test frame. If you like this sort of thing, let me know in the comments and go ahead and click that subscribe button. We covered what this frame does and why it's not working in part one. So if you're starting with this video, you may wanna go watch the first one for some background, but for now, we're gonna jump in right where we left off. After I finished building the wire form for the circuit, it was time to make some space in the frame where I plan to put this. In order to do that, I had to remove a bunch of unnecessary stuff. Fortunately, there are several circuits in here that we can never use in the museum. They're perfectly good, but we just don't have any reason to use them in this machine as it exists today. So we're gonna send those to storage and that should free up a bunch of space here. So I'm gonna be putting the circuit in this frame here. And this frame was originally the sender test relay rack. So theoretically it should have held this circuit, but it, it, it never did. Um, and if we zoom out a little bit, there we go. Uh, you kind of get an overview of the frame that we're putting it in. There's some things in this frame that need to stay here and some things that need to go because I need a lot more vertical height than I have right now. And this frame has actually changed significantly since it came to the museum in the 80s. Um, so let's go through the things I need to keep and the things I need to get rid of. Um, these very lowest circuits down here, they can go away. They're not doing anything for us in the panel and they never will. This was for the sender test frame to handle area codes. We're not gonna use those and we never will. So this can go away. It's not like I'm gonna destroy it, but I am gonna get it out of here and put it in storage. These uh, relays here, they're gonna have to stay. These provide uh, some signaling functionality for the panel switch. I got these, I wanna say in 2018 and put them in here. Um, they're gonna get moved around, but I cannot get rid of them. This empty space is nice. This large uh, kind of tall circuit from here to there, this is part of the uh, automatic test line, dial speed test. So this circuit, uh, I got in 2021 maybe, and it's actually part of a circuit we've always had, which is way up at the top, up there, which is, like it says on the box, auto test line. The automatic test line is something that you can dial into and it will do tests on a subscriber's telephone without the aid of someone sitting in the central office doing the tests for you. So we have three test lines here, one, two, and three, and they're associated selectors. Um, <clears throat> these, I believe, originally came from New York City and they are wired up, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna have to move it. The question is, I don't yet know where. This stuff up here is for MF or multi-frequency sender testing. Again, we're never gonna use it because our senders in the museum can't do MF. So it's gotta go. So we're gonna open up some space there. And as we go up the ladder, this is the other half of that dial test circuit. And then if we go up a little farther, uh, up here, this circuit doesn't matter. I'm not even sure what it does. It's just, it's a single relay. So that can probably go. And then that can go. And then this can go as well. These aren't hooked up to anything. They are actually uh, permanent signal. Uh, actually, no, they're announcement trunks. Um, we're not using these in the panel. They're just sitting here. They're not even wired in. And then I've got all this blank space up here. So by consolidating stuff, I should be able to make enough space for these new circuits. But here we are in the back of the frame. In order to do that, I've got to cut this, this form that's going all the way up this side of the frame. So these wires here, you can see a bunch of them are already cut from when I removed the old circuits. Um, I'm gonna have to disassemble this entire form basically because it's all, it, it was all laced together, but I already started cutting the lacing. And I'm gonna have to rethink how all of this wiring is done. It really hurts, I don't like to do it, 
but the first part of that is to start cutting out the circuits that are not going to be used anymore. That's okay. If I wanted to, I could always rewire them. There's nothing stopping me from doing that, but it's just that they're not actually going to be useful in this switch for what they do. So there's not much of a point in keeping them around, especially since what I'm putting in here is going to be super useful because it's going to make this thing work and I really want this thing to work. So I'll set up the camera, I'll start cutting wires and we'll see what happens. In the comments of the last video, there were a couple of questions that I saw a bunch of folks ask. One of them was, why not mount the new circuits vertically? Well, there's two reasons for that. Number one, there wouldn't be enough room if I did that either. And number two, it would look and feel really wrong to me. Every other relay circuit in the museum is mounted horizontally, and it would really bother me if I did all this work and ended up with a bunch of circuits all lying on their sides. The second thing is that a lot of people suggested that they would just build a circuit using a microcontroller that just does the job of this one. And while that's a valid way of doing things, it's not acceptable to me personally. As a hard rule, I won't attach a computer to the inside of this machine. It's an integrated computer network and I will not have it aboard this ship. But I will not allow a network computerized system to be placed on this ship while I'm in command. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Thank you. Excuse me. Some of the beauty of this equipment is inherent in how it functions on its own, using the tools and constraints that the engineers had at the time. It has a certain spirit to it, a certain magic. And there's something that's lost if I just solve a problem by throwing a bunch of transistors at it. Secondly, I don't enjoy debugging computers. I know a lot of wonderful folks who do, but that's just not how my brain works, and in a very real way, it would be harder for me and much less fun. So I'll take the easier and more fun path, build the circuit with relays using the techniques and tools that they had available to them in this time period. Anyway, once the wires were cut, Matt and I started removing the unnecessary circuits from the frame. And once we had all of them out, we were left with a bunch of non-contiguous empty space. I took a good hard look at the circuits that were left in order to decide if any of the wiring was worth saving. In the end, I decided to just cut the connecting wires and run them over from scratch. I could actually do a much better job than I did with them years ago, and I think it will both look better and function better now. Matt and I got the chain hoist out and started moving things around. These things are about a uh, hundred pounds each, and it was really nice to have a chain hoist to hold them up while I got into several heated discussions with some screws in the ironwork. With all of the circuits now defragmented, I was left with quite a mess of wires that I needed to clean up. This would be a multi-stage operation. Some of these wires need to stay, and some of them need to go away forever. Others should be unlaced and rerun correctly, which is much easier to do now that the frame is temporarily cut dead. The nice thing is that now that the dial and station ringer test circuits are right next to each other, I can reuse their original wiring to interconnect them. I couldn't do this before because they were far enough apart that the wire pigtails hanging off wouldn't reach from one to the other. During this phase of the project, I did get to crack open an original 1920s cable that had not seen daylight in a hundred years, and that was pretty cool. Look at these bright and colorful wires. These are wrapped in silk and cotton, and in order to work with them, you need to take some extra steps first. So there's three different types of wire that you're going to typically see in a central office, and I kind of wanted to show them to you because this project here involves all three. The first and oldest one is this. This is a silk wrapped um, enameled cable and it's this beautiful, uh, really beautiful fabric colored uh, covered cable. But the thing about it is uh, the silk wrapping is very, very delicate and it unravels easily. So if you're just 
trying to connect that to a terminal or something, you could see how quickly that unravels. And then if we unravel it further, we can see that the, that the actual conductor is copper uh, covered in an enamel. That enamel is actually the insulator that's doing the, the heavy lifting there. So this stuff is great, but you cannot work with it in its native form. You just can't. There's, you have to do some work to this cable first before you can start laying it down on a terminal block. So that guy just broke off. And yeah, you could see how the, uh, how delicate the, the covering is on that conductor. The second type of cable is pulp insulated. This came later. This is from the 30s to the early 50s, I wanna say. Now this stuff looks similar, but it's insulated with kind of a paper pulp and it doesn't fray nearly as easily as that silk wire does. So here, if I take it with my right hand and I scratch away at it, the insulation still stays very, very nice um, and, un and unruined. So this is pulp insulated again from the 30s to the 50s. This is the 20s and earlier. Um, and then finally, in the 50s, 60s, and later, you have what's called pick. This is probably what you're used to if you're working with modern cable. This is actually a lot nicer than Cat5. Um, what these, what this insulating layer is made out of, it's a lot nicer to work with. Um, but that's basically all it is. It's plastic insulated cable. And anything from the 60s till now, is this is what you're going to see. When you want to strip this... That's what it looks like when it's stripped. When you strip this one, this paper is some, has some sort of a radiation treatment or something. And uh, these strippers have a little notch in the center. See that little rectangular notch? So when I put the conductor in there, listen for the crack. There's the conductor of that one. And now this one, it's very, very hard or almost impossible to strip because of that silk wrapping. So if you try to strip it, I might be able to get it. Yeah, I got it, but look what happened there. See this? And that's just gonna deteriorate even more. And then of course I have to strip it a second time. There's no way around that because it's enameled. So I have to then go back and well, I stripped it a second time and the little jacket just came right off. So you can see that you can't handle this silk covered wire right out of the box. There's just no way. I took a look at the panel wiring and I had a thought. Let's go look. Okay, this is some very old wiring on the back of our final frame. And this is here, this is all the same wire. It's the silk covered stuff. It's just browned with age. But I've been working with this wire for a while. And I mean, I haven't been working with fresh versions of this wire. I've been working with these old crusty versions of this wire. But I've always noticed there was some kind of coating on it and I never knew what it was because we didn't have any documentation. But then I had a guess, it's beeswax. So I went out and bought some beeswax. Here is an ordinary block of beeswax. And here is a jar of ass bits. And let's put the safety squints on. And so, I didn't heat this up perfectly, but it'll be good enough for a demonstration. Oh. 
cools off pretty quickly once it wicks up these wires. And then you just gotta let it dry. It takes about a minute. Now in this demo, I made a mess because I didn't get the beeswax hot enough and I didn't spread these out before I applied it. So in real life, you'd be a little neater about it. But here's uh, a waxed end. Remember, we couldn't crimp it or clip it or strip it before. Now it strips perfectly. And that insulating layer isn't going anywhere. So that's how to do this. If you ever run across some silk insulated wire, do it a little bit more neatly than I did it <laughs> just for this demo because, well, I was just trying to show you quickly. But there you go. Now I'm gonna go up to the circuit and do it for real. Once I was done with all the wiring, I thought it looked pretty good. These terminal blocks are actually really hard to connect to and I'm proud of how much better I've got at it than years ago when I first connected all these circuits. Incidentally, I think I know why they didn't use these terminal blocks very much, because they are a pain in the butt. Anyway, they're working again, and now we can finally move on to our new circuit. But before we do that, let me take you aside for a moment to show you all of the things that this circuit can do. I should probably do a really full video about this where I fully explain how it works, but I just want to test and make sure that the dial and ringer tests work like they should. And if you want me to do an actual video on this, just let me know in the comments and I'll, I'll write up something. But I think that the, the more I think about it, I could end up talking about this for a half an hour and that is too long for this video. So let me just place a call to that test line that I hooked back up. All right, I've got dial tone. Let's do a ringer test. I'm gonna dial the number eight and then hang up. It's ringing, that's good. And now I'm gonna do a dial test. I'm gonna test the speed of my dial. So I'm gonna dial a two to do a dial speed test. And you'll see the pendulum resets. Here we go. Ah. And that's the sound of a correctly uh, adjusted dial. That's what you get. That sound actually comes from the ringing machine and that is just the sound of bell ringing through the, uh, the receiver of the telephone. So it's just continuous uh, machine ringing without interruptions. If my dial is too slow, it'll make a different sound. I'm gonna force the dial to be too slow. Okay, that's what you hear if the dial is too slow. All right, so that test works. Awesome, I can be done with that. Ready to move on to the next thing. In the next video of the series, I need to mount the new circuit and attach the wire form that I made for it. Then I'll probably need to do a fair amount of work to debug the circuit and fix any mistakes that I made while building the wire form. Hopefully after that, we'll have a nice bespoke wiggler that I can attach to the sender test frame. I'll see you soon.